there are so many opinions out there and they're at our fingertips thanks to the internet and social media. And that's wonderful because you can take those opinions and that information and you can run with it, but you also have to be very cautious. Um, I got roped up in the same thing where I looked at my children and was like, oh my goodness, so-and-so their same age is doing this and my child's doing this. I am so excited to have the opportunity to do something different today. We're going to have a town hall meeting. We're going to have a conversation about the tough questions we get asked on a regular basis from parents when they are striving to homeschool their children. And I have brought the A team here together for you today. I'm really excited to host these ladies. Well, thank you. Um, I'm thrilled to be here. Uh, I am Amanda Caps. I'm coming to you from Northwest Arkansas, where I work remotely for Demi Learning. I'm in the customer service um, side of the company and frequently field these types of questions from our customers who are calling, live chatting, or emailing us looking for support and direction. And so I think this is a very valuable um, opportunity to kind of get this information out en masse. I'm Lisa Cimento. Um, I'm here in my home in Florida, and um, I work as a placement specialist and customer success consultant with Demi Learning, uh, going on almost seven years now. Um, my husband and I homeschooled our four children for 25 years, and uh, they are all adults out of the house now. And it is really a joy and a privilege to be able to support uh, parents and homeschooling families as they work through this journey. My name is Kim Green, and I'm also with the customer service team with Demi Learning. I've been with the company for about six, almost seven years now, and homeschooling mom of two. Uh, one is 20 and a graduate, and he's pursuing things on his own, and my youngest is 17, and we're wrapping up high school. So um, it's been a really great adventure, and I'm looking forward to, to discussing some of the things that we discuss on the phones with customers on a daily basis. Absolutely. I have to say that um, I have brought to you all today three of the most proficient ladies at serving our customers. And if you ever get the opportunity to chat with any one of them, I know that you will be encouraged by the conversation. We have lots of good questions for you. And then we had some of our own that we brought as well. So let's get started here, ladies. Um, the first question I have is, how can I I help my student not to rush through, but actually learn the materials. And I think this is a multifold answer. So I'm going to let each one of you, because I know each one of you kind of have a different flavor for this. I'm going to leave to each one of you give me a brief answer here. Um, and let's go backwards. Kim, we'll start with you. Uh, I would say number one is modeling. Um, I know I myself sometimes have a tendency to rush through things and check it off the list. I'm a checklist person. I know. Um, so just modeling and not being afraid to show your child that you're also working towards, you know, working on that. Um, so I think that would be my number one is just, you know, show it. Um, I, I felt like um, it, it's a good idea to know how your kids are motivated. <laughs> um, my different children were motivated by different things. Some of them didn't like to take time doing things. And I was able to demonstrate how when you rush through something, you often have to redo the whole thing over again afterwards if you haven't done it correctly. And that helped that student understand they weren't actually saving any time. They were actually taking more time because they hadn't done it right the first time. Other kids are motivated by grades you know, different things. You can offer motivational opportunities, a special treat, you know, an activity they enjoy doing well if they if they will take that time. But I think that um, the other thing I wanted to say was there is a value to understanding, helping your student understand that that things won't be mastered all at once. They won't become experts at big things right away and help them to recognize that if they will take the time to really learn the small pieces, the small components, they can become very adept at those things until they become second nature. And then they can put those things together to become very well, um, uh, very proficient at larger things. So parallels of music or dance or ballet or sports, where you learn the individual components of those things first. And then later on, the whole thing is put together to make that person 
really an expert at what they're doing. And, and sometimes kids don't see that if they can't master it immediately and they get discouraged and they just want to rush through it. But maybe if they see that those individual components, there's satisfaction that comes with becoming adept at those things. So I feel like this is a conversation I have with parents a lot when it pertains to showing work like whether a student is just blurting out an answer or they're doing mental math or, or whatever the subject may be. Um, This is a great opportunity to have some dialogue about, you know, especially as we get into fractions, decimals and percents, you know, the pre-algebra concepts and on, you know, a lot of the student's grade is going to be contingent on are we showing our work thoroughly? Do we have all the steps? Have we have we been thorough? Is it legible? I mean, I'm sure I'm not the only parent who has sat down to look at work and gone, what? So again, it's as a parent, I can talk to my student and say, this is a great opportunity for you to really prove to mom what you know. And if I can't read it, if you haven't you know, shown me the full process. This is something we get to practice and master here so that when you are at that high school and collegiate level, I know I've done my best to set you up for success and to equip you to do well and to be thorough and detailed in that environment. But it starts way back in those basic foundational skills. It really does. There's something about testosterone and the desire to just get the answer and not show your work that is pretty universal. And unlike these ladies who are wonderfully encouraging, I was a little punitive with my kids. If you didn't show your work and you got the wrong answer, then you were going to get to redo that problem on your own time outside the school day. And it, I always made sure that if that was an object lesson, the rest of us were going to do something that was really fun. And the kid who was having to redo work was really annoyed because they didn't get to participate. And I recognize that that sounds really mean, but that's a real world consequence of not doing it the way you've been asked. And I think it's important for us as parents to recognize we are raising the next generation of workers And if your boss says, hey, I need you to show me how you got to this end game and you only want to say, nope, here's the answer, that doesn't equate with being an adept employee. And so that was the the message that I always try to (laughs) make my children come away with. Um, Now, my youngest would tell you I was just mean, but he's also almost 19. So he'll get there eventually. Um, The next question I have, ladies, is, and I think this one was just amazing because this is kind of a constant question we all get, and that is, what is the best tips for moms to stay organized and manage their time well, particularly for the high school years? And I want to say that in the show notes, um, we are going to have a couple of referenced events that we have talked about here, uh, webinars that we have done, one with Jonathan Brush and another with Andrew Pudua, and they both have very different approaches to the high school years. And then the last thing I'm going to add is a third one with my friend Alice Reinhart, which is talking about what you as the parent need to document for the high school years so that you know how to get through this um, uh, adeptly or adroitly. But in that, what are y'all, y'all share some tips with these, uh, with our guests today about What's the best tip you have to stay organized and manage your time well? Lisa, let's start with you. Um, Okay, sure. Um, Well, one of the things that I found helpful as my kid, my oldest started to approach those high school years, I asked a lot of questions. I sought out other homeschoolers who had already been there, done that, and I asked what they did. I wanted to know um, you know, what do we have to do about transcripts? Um, what do, you know, how do I do this? What do I do if I want my child to be dual enrolled at the college? You know, how, how do we navigate all of this? And I, t- I asked a lot of questions of a lot of different people and they didn't all have the same answers, but I took all of that information in and gathered it and then figured out what would work best for us. 
Um, the other thing that I learned um, by making the mistake, of course, um, was that I couldn't overbook um, because I had four kids and they were each involved in different things. They were in sports. If they, you know, so if you have children that are taking music lessons or art lessons, or if they're doing college courses or, um, or uh, doing different kinds of, but like a sport each, you can't burn them out and you can't burn yourself out, frankly. Um, you can, you're, you're one person, you can be in so many places. So just be mindful that, you know, in your enthusiasm that you don't overbook. Amanda, I know you never overbook yourself, right? Never. I mean, with, with eight children and uh, a family of 10 to manage, I would, I would never do that. Who, who does that? Um, so for me with this particular question, which we get frequently in customer service, what I tell parents is because each state is so different, what you need to do right away is you need to look long-term. So what are the requirements that have to be met in order for your child to officially meet all the requirements to graduate in your state? And once you have that information, which literally can be as simple as a web search, almost every state has their state's graduation requirements online, and then you work backwards. So if you've got a fifth grader, a seventh grader, a ninth grader, you're literally just going to look at, okay, what do I have to split out into those four years? And what's going to be the best track to do this with this child, keeping their strengths and weaknesses in mind. And then you have at least a framework and a plan going forward and you know what the expectations are and you can discuss that with your students so that everybody's on the same page and you can kind of decide and break out how you're going to do your high school experience. Absolutely. And Kim, of, of, of all four of us, you've got the most recent experience here with Andrew. So what, what was that like doing that with him? Because he did dual enrollment too, didn't he? He did, yes. Um, and so I did the same thing as the other ladies. You know, when he when we were in eighth grade, I started looking at what those requirements were and I started planning ahead. Probably a little too much planning if I look back at it now. Um, I'm much more lax with my youngest. So she's getting a little easier. Um, but I did. I took a look at what my state requirements were, what I wanted for him to do. And then the other tip was to, I also included him. So when it came time to do the dual enrollment, he sat down with me. We looked at what his options might be. He helped to pick out which classes he might want to take first, which it's kind of limited when you're starting. You just have those prerequisites. Um, but I let him be a part of the paperwork process because that to me was a life skill. When he starts transitioning into other things, he's going to need to know how to fill out paperwork. Um, so I included my child with it and I included them in what the plans might be with limitations, of course. Um, but, you know, taking a look at your child and what their needs are, looking at the long term, but then also where is my child headed? Is my child 110 percent heading into a career that they will need a college degree for or are they going to go a different route? Um, my son tried the dual enrollment and he ended up going a different route but I still made sure I set him up so that if he did want to continue with the college classes, he can still do so. Um, so yeah, just looking further ahead, backtracking. And then as far as record keeping goes, pick what works for you. Um, I have a, a system of both. So I do have that big fat old school binder of things and work samples, but then I have a lot of it online, which really helps me when it comes to evaluations. Um, and it's all online through Google in the cloud. So if my computer crashes, I still have access to it. And that way you've not lost anything, but you know, for some people, digital works best. And for some people, we still like that old school binder. <laughs> Absolutely. And I think it makes a difference. And one thing that I will add is I just had a conversation with a mom last week and she said, I don't know why I need to worry about a high school transcript because my daughter wants to go into a trade. And the further we got in the conversation, there is money to be had for her daughter to go to trade school. But in order to do that, she still needs a high school transcript. So I think it's it's a good exercise, regardless of what you think your child is going to do after high school, to help them put that together. Because you can also use that as a tool to look back on and say, here's what you accomplished. Look at what you've accomplished. Now let's see where you're going to go forward. And I think that makes a lot of, 
uh, difference for our kids because sometimes they're a little short-sighted when they're teenagers. They don't see the long game that we play. So how do we manage homeschooling parents encourage and improve our time management skills effectively? And I, I can take this question two ways. Are we talking about our children's time management skills or our own? So ladies, I'll leave that to your interpretation. How about we'll start with you, Kim. Find what works for you and that might, and, and come to the realization that might not be what works for your child. <laughs> so encourage <laughs> them to try different things that work for them. I am a physical planner person. I have tried doing things online. I mean, I have my Google calendar, but I am a physical person. I write my to-do lists on regular old scrap paper, and then I have my planner. Um, my kids, total opposite. My son, if he can do everything on his cell phone, he will do everything on his cell phone. Um, so just finding what works and being open to things that might work for you, you can certainly suggest, but we all know how that goes with teenagers sometimes. Um, let them find what works for them. So I feel like sometimes parents have this idea that, you know, your child is going to, well, and we all get set up because, you know, a lot of times our firstborn does come out of the womb, just driven and, you know, organized and they just grasp some of those skills. I can say this because I am a firstborn. So like, this is me. I'm very type A. I'm very, very organized. Um, and that has served me well in the lifestyle that we've chosen and the way that we school. But you will end up with a child or several that time management skills are not natural. Maybe time blindness is an issue. And you can literally feel like you're trying to nail jello to a tree if you don't have some forethought and some real um, conversations around, hey, um, this is where being an external dialoguer is so important because I've always got a running list and all the things going on in my brain. But a lot of times my children are completely unaware of that. And they don't even hear the internal taskmaster or they were born without it or whatever that looks like. And, um, and so you kind of have to coach them. I mean, if you think of parenting a lot like coaching, I think sometimes it's easier to impart those skills without getting overly frustrated when they aren't just naturally there. They're not just naturally wired the way that you are. Um, so you're not butting heads over these types of differences. And, um, and then there are times where that child who does distract easily or doesn't manage time well can really be a blessing to your family because it takes somebody like me and makes me stop and smell the roses or pay attention to this little detail or, you know, decide, wait a minute, you know, artistic, you know, license is fantastic and beautiful and it adds beauty to our lives that normally I would be too rigid and too type A to even bother with noticing. And so I think you have to look for a really good balance. Lisa, I know that you had some wildly different personalities from you and your family. <laughs> to say the least. Yeah. I had a firstborn like what Amanda is describing. And, and then I had another child um, who who taught me that blind time blindness is a real thing. Um, you know, they can get lost in a book or lost in a project they're doing. I have a daughter who was an artist and she would go into her room and get working on a painting and hours and hours would go by and I would knock on the door and say, Hey, don't you have something you have to be doing? Oh, I've only been yeah, that. Yeah. I have plenty of time. You know, I've just been here for 15 minutes and I, I would point to the clock and she would be astonished you know, literally had no idea how long she'd been there. So um, for certain, you know, kids, sometimes they do, they just lose complete track of the time and you can help them find different tools that will work for them, setting alarms on their phone or a watch or whatever, um, calendar invites. I, I like the idea of if they are given an assignment and they have a week or two weeks or whatever to get it accomplished, let them know 
this is what you have to accomplish or, or sit with them and determine what do I have to accomplish each day in small pieces to get to that place. I was raised by a procrastinator. I mean, he his picture is in the dictionary for procrastination. <laughs> My father was a wonderful man, but he was late to everything. And we were raised that way. And so this is a lifelong struggle for me. So trying to help my kids find the tools so that they wouldn't be like their mother was important. And um, and it didn't come easily for me. But when you have that kind of conversation with your child, you put your heads together and you figure out what's going to work. And, and like Kim said, you got to work with what's going to help them. Different kids work differently. They might need a physical, actual daily planner. And that might be the thing that really floats their boat. You know, some kids love that list making and that check off thing because it's so satisfying. And then others just don't work that way. But you can, if you talk together, you know, when the conversation isn't heated, when everybody's cool and feeling great and you, and outside of school time and you say, okay, I really want to help you with this and let's work on it together and, and let's figure out what's going to work best for you. Right. And I think that there's a piece of valuable advice from each one of you here. And it comes down to conversation of what worked, what didn't work, and allowing your student to help analyze when they're frustrated, when it hasn't worked. Let's take a step back and figure out what we can do next time that will be a game changer. Now, toward that end, I say two things, and this makes me a meanie head, I think. But Kids don't wait. If you're not prepared, your kids are off to the races. Trying to reel them back in is probably one of the most difficult things we have to do as homeschool parents. So it's up to you if you are like Lisa or a little bit like me, who is the inveterate, ooh, that looks like fun kind of girl. You're going to have to learn to manage yourself before you can teach them to manage themselves. And that is sometimes a difficult proposition. If that happens and you find yourself in that position, these ladies are available to help you figure out what might be a plan B. So I think that's an important thing for us to think about. You're not rowing this boat by yourself. If what you're doing, if you find yourself in a continual head bumping situation, then it's time to take a step back and say, what's happening here? And sometimes our kids can be the most valuable, humbling sources of feedback and information for us. So ladies, you guys love this question. How do I catch up my child who is behind? This is a fun one. Um, Lisa's laughing already. Amanda, we'll start with you. So this is, this is such a loaded question. <laughs> Because it really is circumstantial and it's kind of, you know, you, you, you've got to ask some hard questions right off the bat. You know, how did we get here? Was this a situation where, you know, we had a really hard pregnancy and then a hard birth, maybe a NICU stay, you know, something like that. Was there a death in the family? You know, has something external affected your ability to be consistent and to stay on track? Um, that that's one way that we can kind of get derailed. Um, another thing is we can discover that maybe the child in question has some diagnosis. You know, there's something going on foundationally um, or cognitively or visually or auditorily that is hijacking our progress. And so we need to take the time to maybe have some evaluation and figure out what's going on there so that we can have the correct tools and the correct type of curriculum and processes in place to support that student um, and get them back on the road to progress and success. Um, but again, sometimes stuff just goes sideways. And before you know it, a couple of weeks, a few months, you know, might have gone by. But what I love to tell homeschoolers right off the bat is as a homeschooler, because we can be so one-on-one -on -one and more proactive with our time, very rarely are we ever truly behind. And Lisa, you made a valuable observation about this, about working at a student's pace. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah. Um, 
I think first, though, I want to say that sometimes the situation, and I've fielded several calls like this, where a parent has pulled a child from school who's been passed, maybe sometimes with bees, and then they get them home and find out, oh, no, this child has not been learning what I thought they were learning. And then you have to do some evaluating and assessing to figure out where they really are with their skills. And, and it is frightening for a lot of parents. It's it's disarming um, to find out that your your children aren't where you thought they were. So big the biggest thing that I just say is, okay, let's take a big deep breath here first. We're, you know, this is not unfixable. We can we can absolutely work with this and help gain ground. But first we need to evaluate. And sometimes the cause is that there were some gaps in earlier skills that were foundational to what they're doing now. And that's what's causing them trouble. And it maybe has been following them all along through the years. So if they're struggling in math, it may be an earlier math skill that was foundational. If they're struggling in other subjects, problem might be there was problem with their reading skills, you know, and that can affect a whole host of different subject matter. So let's let's do some evaluating and find out and then you know do whatever work is needed to do to go fill in those gaps give them the foundation they need and then move on and then going forward there absolutely is great hope um because you're on a forward trajectory what we want to learn to value is progress you're not going to reach perfection right away but progress and every step of progress is worthy of celebrating and recognizing and taking hold of to motivate you to keep on going so you can try and find materials that will allow you to work at a student's pace and I, I will say this, it's going to sound self-serving, but typically a, a program that was designed for classroom use is probably not going to do that for your student because it was designed for uh, to be homogenous for a host of different kids, and it's going to be filled with a lot of busy work, which your child doesn't need. You're not in a classroom. You are in that one-to-one -one tutorial setting. So find materials that will allow them to work at their pace and that won't be full of lots of busy work. And then also think about different ways that you can utilize time that you hadn't have thought of that don't typically happen in a school. You can utilize weekends. You can work through the summer months. It's not against the law. <laughs> um, and typically, you know, I, I'd schooled year round for the most part. We didn't do a full schedule through the summer, but I made sure that my kids were reading and doing math at least two or three days a week all through the summer. And it made such a difference because they there was just continual progress. We weren't losing a month every, every fall trying to remember all the things they'd forgotten all summer. So there are ways to gain ground that way too. Absolutely. And I think that's a valuable thing for us to bear in mind is when you homeschool, there's no line. You're not behind anyone. And I want to encourage parents to remember that if you say in front of your student, well, this is Owen and he's behind, what does that tell Owen about himself? And I know, Kim, when you became a homeschool mom, you had some of these feelings. So can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, definitely. Um, it's, it's really difficult in our day and age. There are so many opinions out there. And they're at our fingertips, thanks to the internet and social media. And that's wonderful because you can take those opinions and that information and you can run with it, but you also have to be very cautious. Um, I got roped up in the same thing where I looked at my children and was like, oh my goodness, so-and-so their same age is doing this and my child's doing this. Um, and you have to really rein that in and look at your child and stop comparing them to where other children might be in the public school system specifically. Um, and then also, you know, math you see is fantastic. It goes all the way up to calculus. Neither of my children are going to go up to calculus and that's okay. It took my daughter two years to get through algebra one with an ADHD diagnosis mixed in there. And that is okay. So stop comparing your children to, and it's amazing if your child goes all the way up to calculus, awesome but also recognize that some children will not and, and accept the fact that that is okay too. Right. 
And I think that's a really wise advice is to, to uh, know your child well enough to know what their capacities and their strengths are. Um, ladies, here's a, a good question. This was one that came in from a mom. And is math you see enough to prepare my child for the college requirements of a STEM degree? <laughs> yeah, so I had four kids. Two of them were very much of the design artist mentality and they got through their high school math and they were done. They, they, there was not gonna be any more math after that. And that was fine. It was fine with them and it was fine with me too. The other two were more analytical and math minded. And um, both of them went through Matthew C's uh, algebra two course and that's as far as they went. But then they were both able to immediately after that uh, start dual enrolling at the local community college. Um, one of them went through and did several different um, higher level math courses. And my second son actually went all the way through computer science degree and um, up into, you know, calculus three and differential equations and those crazy maths that I, I will never understand and, and is today um, a software engineer. So it does prepare them. And I think one of the real things to keep in mind when you are comparing programs. A lot of people will say, oh, well, Matthew C is not keeping up with what so-and-so is doing in this curriculum. What I will tell you is that Matthew C helps build understanding and kids enter the, the college if, if they're gonna go that way with a deep understanding of the math concepts. Um, my youngest son was in uh, a the college algebra class one day and the teacher did something on the board and was showing them uh, the solution. And my son raised his hand and said, well, well, what about if we did it this way? And the teacher said, well, come on up and show me. And he went up and did it a completely different way. And she was astonished. She was like, I never thought of that, but it worked. And so that, that ability to learn and really understand math and then be able to bring those critical thinking skills to higher level maths in a way that you don't learn sometimes if you're just learning the rules and learning you know, and passing tests, frankly, versus really understanding. And, and that's what the difference I think is. I have a research biologist and a computer scientist, and both of them were Matthew C. kids. And I have to say, Matthew C. was quite a game changer for us. A little bit of it has to do with not the math itself, but learning how to be a student and Matthew C is very adept if you use the materials the way they're designed and you engage in that teach back process, that teach back process becomes a universal skill that they can take into a variety of college disciplines. So I think it's really an important one. This has made me think too, that we really need to make the point. It doesn't matter what curriculum you use. It doesn't matter what learning style or learning preference your child has. When was the last time you sat down and you read a book or you listened to a podcast or you took a course in something and you had 100% retention? So why would we go into the educational environment and expect our children to have a level of retention and achievement that we can't even produce? We need to allow the process and 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 just kind of chill, <laughs> for lack of a better word, chill out a little bit and trust ourselves, trust our students, and trust the process. I think I would just add, um, my oldest is 20. He tried dual enrollment. He did some college classes, and he just totally decided that college was not his thing, and that's amazingly fine. Um, but he has now taken a passion in learning how to fly an airplane. So he is currently taking pilot to get his private pilot license um, training and there is math involved. And I credit Matthew C. He took Matthew C. up through algebra two. He had that conceptual understanding to be able to apply those math skills, not just knowing how to do something, but why I'm doing it. And now he's really going through these classes and understanding the mathematics that's included in a field that he's interested in. That is, I guess, technically a STEM field. Um, and you know he's applying it because he has that deep understanding of why we're doing things, not just plug in your numbers and get your answer. I think it's also really important to recognize, um, I know all of us have had conversations with parents who are like, but we didn't finish the materials. 
public schools don't finish books. Now, in a mastery-based program, we encourage you to finish all the way through a level before you start another level. It's not a good practice to get 18 lessons in and go, we're moving on because we are building that solid foundation. But give yourself permission to recognize that if you are engaging in the materials properly, you're creating a student who has the ability to learn at any level. Ladies, we got a really tough question that I would like to spend a little bit of time with. And um, even Kathleen, who's not here today, God bless her, she's on vacation. So she gave us a great piece of feedback for this question. And the question is, and I want you guys to think about it. The question is, is, are there any homeschool regrets that we would have that we can learn from? And I'm going to share Kathleen's. She said her regret was not taking enough pictures. She saved so much of their work and their artwork, but she wished she'd just taken more pictures in the process. And she said the other thing she wished is that she had learned early on to give her kids a voice in what they were learning about. She said, I finally learned to ask them and they wanted to learn whenever there was a choice. How about you ladies? What do you have for me? Who wants to go first on this one? And yes, I did pull the grenade pin and hand it to you all. So here we go. I'll go first um, because I can kind of tip off of Kathleen's just a little bit, the same thing. It took me longer than it should have to listen to my children. And for me, it was, this is what we're going to do versus listening to my children and, and respecting them enough to listen to them, to tell me what they were interested in doing. And once I flipped that mindset, it has been a total game changer for us. My daughter was not a science kid, but the minute that I put the ball in her court and she got to choose what science she's run with it. She loves zoology. She's, you know, we've put together different programs and things based on her interests. And now there's a passion for learning because I stepped back and listened. Um, and I actually apologize to my son as a grown man because I wish I would have done that earlier with him. And I, it took me longer to learn than it should have. <laughs> Yeah, I, I love what Kim just said. And 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 my preface right here will be, um, you will make mistakes. <laughs> be ready to acknowledge them and apologize to your kids. They are very forgiving. I, I found that my children were able to forgive anything as long as I was not being hypocrite. You know, if I could just be honest with them and say, I really blew it here. Um, you know, and, and ask for forgiveness. They were really great about it. And then we just moved forward from there, lesson learned, you know. Um, for me, mine is a little similar to Kathleen's. I did take photos and I kept work, but I didn't. One of the things that I had heard another homeschooling parent had done, and I just thought it was brilliant. She kept almost like a journal of what they had done. And she was writing things out anecdotally and um, recording all kinds of things. So when they, when at the beginning of the year, she had a plan of what they were going to do that year, she wrote it out, not in a schedule or plan form, but just as um, prose, I guess you would say. And when they went on a trip or they did an event or they did a field trip or whatever they did, she'd come back and record what happened and what, how they felt about it and different events like that. And I wish that I had thought to do that because then I would have this forever record that I could go back and read from time to time. And, you know, I just think that I would, I would love to be able to go back because you do forget a lot of things. I'm glad for the stuff I did keep. I did keep artwork and I can go back and look at those adorable pictures and things. But, um, but I wish I had kept a written record. So I have an incredibly wide range of ages. Um, you know, I had my first daughter when I was 20. I had my last child, and there are eight of them, when I was 39. And so that is a huge span of years, and it is parenting multiple ages at the same time. And so I would have to say, on the positive side, I had a little bit of an unfair advantage because I'm a second generation homeschooler. So I had a homeschool background to pull from. And I wasn't really under that, this is what school looks like. I very much embraced the 
every day, every moment is an opportunity to be learning and to be learning together and that you can really bring education into any experience. But because of pregnancy, nursing, toddlers, you know, those really hard years. I mean, there's nothing more exhausting than the transition of adding a new baby to a family and the lack of sleep and establishing, you know, breastfeeding and all of that stuff. And so it meant that there were opportunities sometimes that my older kids were doing that I would have had the opportunity to participate and support and be there for them in but actually I couldn't because of younger siblings. And so nothing really in the parenting world prepares you for parenting all different ages, you know, young adults, teens, tweens, the the middle kids and toddlers and babies all at the same time. And so you really need to give yourself some grace, but you also need to acknowledge that that inquires intense sacrifice, not only for yourself, but for your older students as well, because you might not be physically present or available in ways. Um, and that's where your community, grandparents, aunts and uncles, cousins, I mean, that's where your homeschool groups, I mean, And having that community to have other people who can step in in your absence is so critical. We are not prescient. We don't see the end game. So keep those accounts short. Like Lisa said, our kids are forgiving. And uh, I think it's important. I wish I'd ask my kids their opinion more. Um, I was a little directive. And I wish I had taken more time to be a bigger student of them. And I think that that makes a tremendous difference. Okay, ladies, we love this question. So how are we going to deal with perfectionist meltdowns? And I'm going to make this one statement. I regularly make parents upset at homeschool conferences when I say this, but um, it takes one to know one. Perfectionists aren't born, they're made. So how do we help our kids when they have that perfectionistic tendency. Who wants to take this one on first? Um, It's very difficult. It's very difficult if you are a perfectionist and you you may have been raised with some some critical feedback and that led to you becoming a perfectionist and maybe you don't realize it until you're an adult and then you start to see it in your children and then you realize that the cycle is there. Um, For me, I've been reading uh, some books and some literature on highly sensitive people and really recognizing myself and in doing so also recognizing my children. Um, And so having that understanding of what's actually happening in the brain when you are having those moments of, you know, being critical to yourself, being a perfectionist, it's actually a control thing and your brain panics because you don't have control. And that is what happens. And then in your child, they don't have that emotional regulation in order to deal with that. Um, And some of us as adults don't have that emotional regulation to deal with that at times, depending on the situation. Um, But it has given me a lot more patience and understanding. So the more that I'm learning about it, the more that I'm understanding it and the more grace I can give myself and my kids. Um, I only wish that I had read some of this literature when my kids were younger. And that way I would have had a lot more patience and compassion, not just with them, but also with myself as being a perfectionist. It's really difficult to stop being a perfectionist. (laughs) It is. Now you actually recommended a book to us um, by Dr. Elaine Agron. And the title is? She has more than one book. Um, The Parenting the Highly Sensitive Child is an amazing book. That would be the one I would start with. Um, And then there is one geared towards you. And that is just, um, living in a world as a highly sensitive person. I can't remember the exact title of it, but it's basically geared towards adults, um, where it's, you know, recognizing that you are a highly sensitive person and how do you navigate in a world when you are a little bit different sometimes than others. Terrific advice. Wonderful. (laughs) Ladies. Yeah. Yeah. I'll share. Um, because I, I struggled a lot with that myself. Um, and, and I think the thing that I've come to the conclusion of is that that we are all on this lifelong learning journey. Every one of us, there's no stopping it. You, you don't become an adult and suddenly you stop learning because you've got it all. So 
there there is power in admitting to your children that you have faults and that you are working on them as well and that you are trying to learn from your own mistakes. And then once you can get a grip on that, I think you have an opportunity to begin to model for your children how you react to your own mistakes, to your own so-called failures, to disappointments when your expectations aren't met, things like that. And when you begin to show them that there is an appropriate way to, instead of reacting, but to responding to them, then they begin to see that it is okay for them to make mistakes. It's okay for them to have disappointed expectations and it's not the end of the world. Saying that to a child, it's not the end of the world. It's not going to do it. <laughs> you really need to, you really need to model this. And, and I keep coming back to that more is caught than is taught uh, saying that I've heard so often, um, they are really watching you much more than they are listening to you. If you, <laughs> you probably asked yourself that, is anybody listening to me? Well, they might be, but they're really watching you more. So um, this is the time for you to be able to take a good, hard look at yourself and be honest with yourself and ask yourself questions that you hadn't thought to ask and maybe even go to people that you trust um, to be honest with you in a loving way and ask those questions and and um, uh, get started on that lifelong learning journey yourself and then invite your kids to come along with you. I think it's really important to recognize that if you are struggling with perfectionism, nine times out of 10, you're also struggling with being a people pleaser. And so I have found immense freedom in recognizing as I have gotten older, that no is a complete sentence. Like the world doesn't stop spinning. The apocalypse does not happen. If you say the word no to a child, to an adult, to an, to, you know, an opportunity, you can't do it all. We're human. We think we can do it all. We oftentimes over schedule and overextend ourselves because that's so ingrained in our culture right now. Um, and I think we get a lot of that from social media because we have to be able in our brains as an adult, I can rationally go, okay, this is somebody's highlight reel. I'm not seeing that the cat puked on the carpet at two in the morning, that the toddler took their diaper off in the crib and painted the walls with the contents. I mean, you're not seeing- We don't put that on social media, come on. <laughs> right, right. I mean, who would who would do that? Um, but those are the things that are happening behind the scenes. And I promise you that those are the situations that your children are really watching for your response and your reaction to way more than when everything's going great, and you're having an on morning and breakfast went smoothly and everybody got in the van on time with shoes to church, you know, I mean, th those rare, like, wow, I really may have my life together moments are great, but they're the exception, not the rule. And I think when you struggle with perfectionism, the biggest obstacle that we face is like failure is the end all be all. And yet failure is where we learn the most. We don't learn things when we're in the mountain vistas and the views and the beauty. We learn in the valleys where it's hard and we're tired and we're overextended. And, you know, the, 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 the everyday things, I mean, I'm in a first responder family. And so the running joke is if it's gonna break, if it's not gonna work, if it's gonna, have an issue, it's gonna happen on shift day when my husband is not here and I am here doing doing all the things and all the parenting. It's just, it's just life. And so you need to be able, again, like both ladies said, your own self-regulation is so critical. And then be the adult responding the way you would have wanted to be responded to when you messed up. Think about that ahead of time and have a plan so that when it does hit the fan, you are in a, an emotionally regulated place 
where you can show grace and love and acceptance. We tend to develop perfectionist tendencies when we have a parent who becomes emotionally dysregulated when things don't go well. And I know all of us know what that feels like to be the child as recipient, but to be the parent as deliverer. And so if you can, in that space of time that one of you said was so important, not as it's happening, but later, if you can sit down and say, hey, here's, like Lisa said, keep your accounts short, say, this is where I made a mistake and can't, let's learn together from this. Um, there's also tremendous virtue is a perfectionist is start making mistakes in front of your child and making light of those mistakes. Ladies, I want to turn my attention. We have so many more questions and we're just about out of time. So I want to turn my attention to this question because this is one we get. So I want each of you to think about your answers so we can keep it brief. But I think it's really important that we answer this question. And that is, will homeschooling my teen with auditory processing and ADHD be better than in an actual school? And I know each one of you have feedback on that. So Kim, I'm going to start with you. Um, this short answer is yes. Um, the flexibility that homeschooling gives you, um, the ability to break learning down into manageable pieces, choosing curricula that fits your child and your child's needs. Um, you know, for instance, my daughter, she sometimes creates her own schedule. She knows this needs to be done by Friday. I don't care. She wants to on Tuesday tackle all of her English for the week and on Wednesday tackle all of her math for the week. That's how her brain processes it. And that works for her. Great. It allows me to do that for her. She also takes 5 million snack breaks a day. She listens to music while she's working. You can't do those things in the public school setting. Um, and she doesn't have to sit still for eight hours a day. And she doesn't have to sit for hours at a time in a class that she would be doing. And she did experience it going back to public school for ninth and part of 10th grade. Um, so it just, it allows her to have that freedom to do those things. And then it also allows us as a homeschooler if she can do it and show me mastery, why am I going to make it, her do it 10 times? Why am I going to give her busy work with worksheets, tailor it to your child and not make it extra? So yeah, yes, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, you can curate the environment and tools they need to be successful. I mean, it's as simple as that. Um, you can make accommodations. You can do things that a teacher and a classroom that they're just, they don't have the resources or the ability, um, like several of the things Kim mentioned, um, you know, music, uh, mind take trampoline breaks all the time. They just need to get some big muscle movement happening between subjects. Um, we don't spend our blocks. I mean, 10, 15 minutes and then change it. It's not that you can't circle back around and do another math session if you need to, to get it all done in a day. Um, but yes, I often find my students that are different learners, uh, especially would prefer to stay focused or hyper focus on something, but then something they don't enjoy. They just want to spend as little amount of time as possible. Yeah. Just the bottom line is, you know, your children better than anyone on earth and you love them better than anyone. And, um, you have the ability, no, no, um, disparagement of teachers. I, I have the, the greatest admiration for loyal, devoted, um, uh, capable teachers, but because they are handling so many children and, and they have to stay within the guidelines that the school, um, creates for them, they are not able to know your children as well as you do and be able to tailor what needs to be tailored. You can. You, you're in a tutorial setting. You're not in a classroom. Absolutely. All wise words for that ADHD child. I was diagnosed with ADHD at 55 and it explained a lot. It explained why watching me clean is enough to drive someone who's orderly and linear absolutely insane. I'd get the job done, but it would drive everybody nuts in the process. And being able to recognize that in myself has given me a lot more grace for my ADHD children um, to recognize, oh, yeah, ran it off the rails here. Let me help you bring it back. 
and to do it with humor and grace. I think that makes a lot of difference. Ladies, we've reached the top of the hour. So I would ask each of you for your closing thoughts and um, we'll do this uh, a little bit uh, backwards. So I'll start with Kim. Kim, what advice would you have for our parents as they walk forward in this? Uh, trust yourself and value your child enough to trust their input with things as well. Um, don't be afraid to learn alongside them. Don't be afraid to be a lifelong learner. Um, let them see your failures. Um, you know, teenagers especially, they love to see that you don't know everything because of course they do. Um, <laughs> you know, and, and it's allow yourself the grace to start as they get older. And that's the phase I'm in. So that's where, you know, I come from mostly, but start passing the baton, give them some independence, give them some, some feedback into things and let them be a part of the homeschooling journey. Wise words, Lisa. Um, yeah, you, you don't have to do everything, but you can be the one that makes the decisions about how you'll do things. Um, listen to your kids, get their input talk to other uh, folks and get their input, and then you can make your own decisions. If you decide you are not up to teaching a certain class, you can find the person or organization or whatever that you want to teach that particular course to your student. You have the final say in those things. And if you have questions, we are here. Um, please pick up the phone and give us a call. We've got a toll-free number at the Deming Learning site. Um, give us a call. We talk to folks every single day. And sometimes all we're going to do is ask questions that maybe you hadn't thought to ask yourself. And sometimes just asking those questions helps you drill down and find the answers. Absolutely. Amanda? I'm just going to park on community. I mean, you really need a mentor in your life that is already where doing and, and where you want to be. And then you need to say, please adopt me. Let me learn at your feet. <laughs> Let me pick your brain. Um, and sometimes that is somebody in your family. I mean, I have the benefit of that being my mom and a lot of times because she homeschooled us, but sometimes it's not. Sometimes your family is the least supportive of your choices on how you're educating your children. And that's not the end of the world. You can find friends and community outside of that. There are the, you know, for all the negatives of social media, there are positives because there are groups and things, you know, available to you that you can join and put your questions out there. And, and like Lisa said, we're here. We can talk you off the ledge. We can give you some new ideas. We can, ask you some questions that might just lead you to your own conclusions and answers that you were just struggling because you're so concentrated on the situation and the struggle at hand. Um, between the, all of us, I mean, the combined experience is, is massive and we want you to take advantage of it. We want you to reach out to us. We don't want you to sit there and be frustrated and feel like throwing in the towel or, or worse, you know, putting them on the school bus the next day. I mean, we've all had that thought. We've all been there and we can absolutely be there for each other. I can tell you that the privilege that I have to work with these ladies is profound and I don't take it for granted for a single minute. My advice to you is to get a notebook. It doesn't have to be an expensive one, but I'm going to piggyback off of something Lisa said. It's easy for us to remember the difficult things. If I ask you all to remember the difficult thing that happened last week, whatever the most difficult thing, all of you could be there in a heartbeat. I want you to write down the joyful things. And so when you have a day that's less than joyful, you can go back to that notebook and refill your cup because I think it makes all the difference in the world. Ladies, thank you so much for your time today. It's been my very great pleasure to host this for you and with you. And I'm looking forward to us doing this again. I think it has value. So you can access the show notes or watch a recording at demilearning.com slash show, or even on our YouTube channel. Be sure to rate, review, and follow wherever you may be watching or hearing this, especially if you really liked it. And we'll look forward to coming into your homes again in the near future. Take care, everyone. Have a joyful afternoon.